Hello. Hello. You're excited. Because, especially her, because we get to hear from a living God this morning. We get to hear from a living God this morning. Yes, because our God is alive and our God is here. In fact, I got to be honest with you, we're going to spend a lot of time here because I want to hear directly from him and I want you to get to the end of this proclaiming yet out these doors, holy, 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 and I love you and I want to respond because you're a God who is still speaking to his people and that's us. Each time I open this word, and even as I was praying for you all and what I would get to share with you, I was reminded of a trip I got to take to Israel. In that trip to Israel, I learned that church back in the first century was a little different than most churches are today. Here's how. See, nowadays, we always kind of have people up at the front that are presenting truth, right? Usually they stand up there and, oh, not anymore. And so, but back then, it was a little bit different. Specifically in a synagogue we visited in Israel, the church setup was different. Not everyone staring at a stage, but rather everyone was in a big circle. So, and then the person in the center, excuse me, yeah. That's fine. Watch your face. Yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we're good. Hi, nice to meet you yes. up close. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was like this. Thank you. And so, you know, you'd bring in the Moses seed and they'd set it out at the center and everyone was in a big circle. Here's why. When you look past me, what do you see? People. Yes. Because they wanted you to understand right away. The church, while yes, you attend church, you go to church, it is a building, but friends, really, it's the people. They wanted you to get that right away. Which, by the way, reminds me that we should be very careful if we ever critique the church. Because <laughs> it's us we're critiquing, you know what I mean? And it got worse when you walked in. So... This is church. And it would start with like prayers and blessings. And you know, now we have worship through music. Back then they worshiped in a lot of ways. Sometimes people would stand up and just proclaim truth about who God is. Someone over here would stand up and say, God is awesome. awesome. I know. And then someone over here would say, God is gracious. It's all grace, isn't it? And I love it because as someone would proclaim that, everyone else would be like, ooh, Mufasa. And so... There was a guy, though, that worked at the church who really loved his job, and they talked about him in the synagogue long time after. This particular guy, excuse me, uh, what he did is he was basically the janitor. He got to clean up after the service, but the reason this guy really loved his job was because part of his job was to go to the Torah closet where they would have the scrolls that were going to be read. See, today we have the Bible in book form. Back then it was a bunch of scrolls. And this guy loved his job because he would grab the scroll and he would get to bring it out. Friends, the stories they were still telling in this synagogue about that guy was that this guy would never just walk out the scrolls. No. <laughs> he would always dance out the scrolls. Can you, can you picture it? And he's like, oh, what? Uh, you know. And then he, you know, and he would bring, and suddenly as he began dancing, everyone just would start to go nuts. And he'd be like, yeah. And everyone's like, yeah. And he's just dancing, and this whole side's like, ah. and he just keeps going. And the reason he's going nuts, the reason he danced, and the reason all the people at this moment would go absolutely berserk was for this reason, because it was the moment in the service where we got to hear from a living God. Friends, this is the moment. And I love that he speaks in an assortment of ways. He can speak in our spirit. He can speak through worship songs. And he can also speak through his word in a really powerful way. And the people would go nuts. And I think the reason they would go nuts, hold on, is because this world is really loud, right? Because the world is screaming a lot at us, right? What are you hearing? Because it's very tempting to hear those words over this word, right? What words are you hearing? Have you ever heard, um, be impressive? Show everyone how important you are. At holiday meals where they ask all the questions, you know what I mean? Have something profound to say about yourself. <laughs> Friends, here's the beauty of this word is, this word tells a very different story. 
but it's one worth sharing. And friends, if we'll let it, God's word will speak much louder, and that's the, that's the voice we need to hear. And so as you look to the stage, you're gonna see this timeline. You're going to see this timeline of a God who is from the very beginning wanted to speak to his kids and wanted to make a way for his kids to not only hear from him, but also to be with him. And it starts in the very beginning, and we're going to go through the whole thing, so we should probably get started. You think I'm kidding. Genesis chapter 1. Are you ready to hear from God? Church, let's do it this morning. Genesis chapter 1 begins like this. It starts with creation, and this is the story that we know when time began, but really God existed far before the garden that he created. But we start in a garden, and in the garden, God begins to create, and he creates the garden. And it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Our God was present in the beginning. In fact, I love the truth about it. Where was he present? He was present in the formless, the emptiness, and the darkness. And friends, that's still true today. Some of you are experiencing a whole lot of darkness, and I'm here to tell you who God was is who God is and who God will forever be. God is present there too. He's still moving, still showing himself off. In fact, he speaks in that place too, verse three, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. See, when God speaks, creation at its best responds. When God speaks, creation responds. But something went wrong. And I'll tell you, I could put it a lot of different ways, but simply, Adam and Eve, the first created people hanging out in a garden, they listened to the wrong voice. And I think we've been doing it ever since. And friends, if we're not careful, we're just going to think that that voice is normal. And here's the response to sin. They were ashamed by their sin. They listened to another voice. They were ashamed. So they, chapter three, we read about it. Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And here's their response. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Friends, they were scared when God came near because suddenly, because of sin and its effects, they saw that sin has these consequences. So they hid. And it's crazy, even in the midst of Christmas, which is all about Jesus, it's tempting for us to kind of maybe hide or miss him too, and I don't want us to miss him this Christmas season. But here's the good news. God does not respond to us in the same way we respond to him. Verse 9 But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Friends, can I start with God's first question? Hey, where are you this Christmas season? A little bit distracted? A little bit unfocused on the right things? Here's what I love. In the midst of our sinful nature, God, since the beginning of the timeline as we know it, he, rather than hiding from Adam and Eve, he, don't miss the significance of this, God moves toward them. And he initiates relationship with them, clearly not because they deserve it. (laughs) He starts with two questions, really. He says, where are you? And then the second question, verse 11, he says, who told you that? Who told you that lie you've been listening to? Who told you you have to be perfect or pretend that you are? Who told you that the way you've defined yourself by your sin issue or that one time, you've let that become who you are, friends? Who told you that? You see, our God moves toward his people and he begins to initiate relationship. Why? Because our God wants to be with his people. Our God wants to be with his people. But sin has to be dealt with. But God wants to provide a way to be with his people. See, I used to think that this entire biblical timeline, this story of God was a story of a bunch of people pursuing God. And now, friends, then I read the book. (laughs) And I realized this is not a story of God 
of people pursuing God. This is a story of God pursuing really imperfect people and using them anyways. Adam and Eve messed up. Then they had two boys. Oops. Then, that didn't go so well. And generations later, God dealt with sin in a very serious way. Remember Noah and the flood? Just a few generations later, we meet Abraham, who has a son named Isaac, who has a son named Jacob. Jacob is renamed Israel. He has 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes, right? The children of Israel. Huh? <laughs> and then they find themselves enslaved. And then God sends a guy named Moses. Remember that guy? Remember Prince of Egypt, the movie, huh? Sends that guy and says, go rescue them out of this place. And I love Moses' response, but God, I, he's like, oh, it's not about you. <laughs> oh, it's not about you. And it's not about what you can't. It's not about what you can't do. It's about showing off what I can do, God says. And so Moses says, yes. And he gets to be a part of this grand exodus of people, right? And Moses gets to lead the people out. And, and, and God does a work and he uses this guy named Moses and he brings people out. And then they find themselves in a desert, but specifically at the base of a mountain. And the second place that we really get to see the manifest presence of God moving and descending down toward his people. But here's the deal, friends. Our God is holy, holy, pure, blameless, powerful, in fact, that might be why we read about God's presence descending onto the mountain with the children of Israel and Moses in this way in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Oh, you thought I was kidding. We're going through the whole thing. I wasn't kidding. So on the morning of the third day, listen to how God's presence comes near his people. Don't ever miss the power of our God. On the third day, there was a thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp. Why? To meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire. Why? Because our God wants to be with his people. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sounds of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Friends, verse 20, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them will perish. Why? Because our God is holy and he's perfect, but he wants to be with imperfect people, but there's a specific way to do so. And that's why he goes on. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord God will break out against them. Friends, sin must be dealt with. Why? Because our God is holy, holy, holy. He is set apart. He is powerful. He takes sin seriously. But friends, all throughout scripture, we're coming to find that our God, that God, wants to still make a way to be with his people. He wants to be with us. And on that mountaintop is when he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. In fact, that's the very next chapter. Remember those? Friends, I love listening to the commandments in the context of the big grand story. Why? Because otherwise, if you don't listen to it in context, then Christianity may quickly become just a bunch of rules. Have you ever heard that critique of Christianity? Oh, it's just about doing all the right stuff. Oh, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. Remember the children of Israel, they were enslaved. God rescues them, gives them freedom, and then says, and here's 10 commands, not to earn your freedom, but to how to live like you're free. <laughs> Do you see the difference? The Ten Commandments were not given as, obey these Ten Commandments and then you will be free. Nope, God rescued them, set them free, and then says, here's how to live like it. Friends, all these commandments you read throughout the scriptures are God saying, here's how to live into who you already are. Not live this way to earn it. You can't earn it. You didn't earn it. But I made a way. I earn it on your behalf. We're gonna get there in the story. Why? Because it's a really good story we're a part of. But friends, it's a story all about our God who really wants to be with his people. 
and who makes a way. In fact, on the mountaintop, not only does he give 10 commandments, he also says, hey, Moses, I'm going to have you build a sanctuary. It's going to be called a tabernacle. It's a tent-like structure. My presence will be near, and you have to build it a really specific way. And you're going to be able to, it's going to be able to be moved because I see that my people are going to wander and I want there to be a focal point of my presence. So it's going to be a tent-like structure and inside the tent there's going to be the Ark of the Covenant. Remember Indiana Jones? And inside there's going to be the most holy of holy places, but you have to build it precisely like I say. He says it in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 when he says this to Moses, then have them make a sanctuary for me. Why? And I will dwell among them, not because they deserve it, but because he's moving toward us still. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings, this word is key, exactly like the pattern I will show you. Friends, he wants to be with his people, but because of sin, he must teach them how to approach him. He takes worship very seriously, and he also takes the consequence of sin very seriously. And so he spends chapter after chapter in the book of Moses saying, this is exactly, I need it to be precise, and I need it to be perfect, this tabernacle, because I want to be with my people, but I'm a holy God, and these are very imperfect people, but I want to move toward them. So make this tabernacle precisely like I say. And then they did. And God moved toward them yet again because God wants to be with his people. And all these children of Israel, these different tribes, begin to become united under King David just generations later. And underneath King David, he says, I don't want it just to be a tabernacle, a tent-like structure carrying them from place to place. I want to build a temple. And I want it to be epic. Why? Because our God is. And so he begins to plan it, and God says, yes, 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 a, t a temple. I want to be with my people. But here's the deal, Daniel, or David, you got a blood on your hands. We're going to go with your son to build this one. And Solomon builds the temple. First Kings chapter 8, we read a little bit more about this temple, and specifically the fact that right after the, the priests who from the tabernacle bring the Ark of the Covenant into the most holy place, which, by the way, only one priest could go into one time a year. Everyone else could draw really near, and God had precise ways of doing it. And right in the midst of them bringing the Ark of the Covenant where the Lord's presence dwelled, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 says this, when the priests withdrew from that holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Friends, God wants to be with his people God wanted to be with his people, and at this point in history, only one priest who went through this firm ritual could enter into the most holy place once a year. Everyone else could draw a year, but friends, here's where the story gets crazy. God wanted to be with his people so much so that he became one of them. You see, people had waited long ago from a promise from way back in the garden that God will make a way for us to be with God, not just in the moment, but be with God forever. And we have that promise, and it's the reason we enter into the month of December with purpose. We read about it in Matthew chapter 1. When the angel of the Lord approaches Joseph, who is specifically through the line of David, just like was promised, the angel of the Lord moves toward Joseph and says this, Matthew chapter one, verse 21, she, referring to his fiance Mary, will give birth to a son, and here's what you're gonna name him. We got a name for the boy, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Friends, sin is the reason that the separation happened in the first place. And I love that right when he gives the name in the first place of God coming to be with his people, he goes, here, even in his name, he's gonna prove that he wants to be with you. He is gonna take care of the sin, the sin that you're gonna try to take care of on your own, but that's impossible, that you could only draw near. In fact, instead of you drawing near, God drew near to you when you couldn't draw near to him. Not only will he save his people from his sins, verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with 
us. Friends, every world religion has a metaphorical staircase of people trying to go in the right direction, of people wanting to get closer to God, to climb their way up to God. People even wrote songs about it. Stairway to heaven. Because <laughs> people want to be close to God, don't you? Isn't some of you like, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> but I have to like clean up first, right? And forever, every single world religion has these metaphorical stairways. In fact, certain world religions have like levels. Levels to get there, levels of heaven even, of how high you must climb. Friends, this, Matthew chapter one, this manger, this moment, this person is the distinction between Christianity and every other world religion. How so? Because every world religion has the staircase. But the difference is, because God knew that you could not climb up the staircase to get to God because the problem with the staircase is the staircase is infinite because our God is holy and our God is perfect. So the staircase just keeps going. The distinction between Christianity and every other world religion is this. Because God knew you couldn't climb up to get to him, God climbed down the staircase to be with us. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. That's why we celebrate. That's why we buy trees. I buy trees. You guys <laughs> cut yours down. That's why we have the decor. That's why everyone makes a big deal. And that's why everyone shows up because they're just trying to get really close to God. But we're here to tell you that there's a reality that's different than you just showing up. It's the fact that God already showed up. He already showed up the scene. And I know all of you have been reaching for him, trying, and you've been reaching and trying and reaching. And he's going, I've been here the whole time. You don't have to reach up anymore because I reached down and came near. I didn't come near. I didn't even stop by coming near. I came to dwell. You see, on Christmas, there's a different message. You see, unlike the most holy places in the tabernacle and in the temple, when Jesus comes close, he gives a different word, Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, I love the next word, all not just the most holy, not just once, once a year, not just near, come to me. Don't just come to a place, come to a person this Christmas season. All who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. I find it interesting that one of the most hectic, stressful seasons for me is Christmas. Isn't that a little silly? When God's going, the reason I came is that you wouldn't have to be. And friends, he didn't just come to dwell with us, he came for us. And as the story continues, our God earned a perfect relationship with his heavenly father. Jesus, fully God, fully man, was perfect. He alone earned intimacy with the father. We earned to be separate. We actually earned death. And that's why he died. He took that which we earned. And he gifts us that which he earned which is a relationship with the Father. You do not get a relationship with the Father because you earned it. You can't. He earned it on your behalf. And in his resurrection, he proved that he can make even dead things alive. And the wages of our sin is death. We deserve to be separate, to not be anywhere near. And God says, I've come near to make a way, not just now, that you can be with God here and now, but also the last area with me forever in heaven, and he made a way. But here's the crazy, it even gets crazier. This Christmas narrative invades our current realities too. I remember going to a Christmas service, and the theme of the Christmas service for my specific church I was attending at the time was called Emmanuel, and for four weeks we were studying Emmanuel, God with us, God with us, and everything was beautiful. The trees, the lights, the everything. And each week, week number one, they gave a really great message on Emmanuel. And afterwards, we're like, that was lovely. 
Week number two, another great message. And I'm like, that was just so good. Week number three, right in the midst of all the beautiful things. I will never forget week three of Emmanuel service because it was in the middle of week three that a guy walked on stage in the middle of the service that probably shouldn't have been there. I know he was messing up the Christmas. Not, I mean, he literally stumbled in the middle of the worship set onto the stage and everyone kind of sat back like, this, does, this can't be, this isn't right. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit all the beautiful pieces. And then he, and he leans on the podium and everyone's like, oh no. And everyone's kind of watching the pastors. Are they as surprised as the whole congregation is? And he leans in. He's like, Emmanuel, God with us. Man, but where was God when? And he began to share a really tragic story. Have you ever wondered where the Christmas narrative, it's a really beautiful story. God with us, where does that mesh with our harsh realities of today, anyone else? This guy stood before the whole congregation and now we're all just watching this man and he begins to break. He's like, it was exactly six months ago plus three days and some odd hours and he tells this tragic story and he goes, where was God then? Where was he then? And he had kind of leaned forward and he's like, you know, I'm still wondering that really big question. I know God's giving me hints, but I just want to say a couple thank yous. Thank you too. And he points out, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Chung, thank you for starting the meal train. <laughs> you guys, thank you. He's like, and thank you for the Smiths. Thank you for showing up and dropping off that meal. And to be honest, Smiths, thank you for not staying. <laughs> we didn't even have the energy to host. So thank you for not, thank you for leaving. They're like, okay. He's like, thank you. And he just starts naming everyone in the crowd. He's like, and thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred, for the daily text of the Bible verses. At first, I was frustrated by them. <laughs> But now I've just come to become part of my rhythm, so thank you, Fred. And thank you, Sharon. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. And thank you for dropping this off. And thank you, that couple right there, for coming over and sitting on the couch and just being with us. And to be honest, not giving us any advice in the darkest season of our life. Thanks for just being present. He goes, so here I am today, six months, some days, and a couple hours later, I'm here to stand before you and say, Emmanuel, God with us, church, I'm beginning to realize, where was he? Well, he dwells within you. And then he sat back down. And I'll never forget it, because he recognized that us, we look at the Christmas narrative backwards. We look back. See, God had another plan. The Christmas narrative did not just stop with a manger. Friends, are you ready for some of the craziest things? Because here's the truth. God does not just save us from our sins, which would be enough for us to worship him and be thankful forever. He does not just save us from our sin. He saves us for a purpose as well. And maybe some of you are attending church going, I just need cleansing, I just need to be closer, and I'm here to say, yes, you do. And he paid a way for that to be possible, but he also gifts you something more you don't deserve. He wants to give you a purpose and something to live into this Christmas season. Are you ready for it, friends? See, because here's the deal, between the manger and between heaven, there's a little place, and there's a little group of people, and they happen to be called the? It's us. That is why Matthew, at the very end of his life, in Matthew chapter 28, gathers his disciples. By the way, any single person who calls upon the name of the Lord can be one of those. To say, I put my trust in you and not in my ability to get to you, but my trust that that's why you came to me. The moment you profess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, not just for heaven, but also for purpose here and now. And he welcomes him in. In Matthew chapter 28, the very last chapter in the book of Matthew, he brings his disciples and he's like, come close. He goes, I have a purpose and I have a plan. Guess what? My plan A is you. <laughs> Oh, and there's no plan B, so don't screw it up. <laughs> Friends, you're plan A. And he leans and he goes, okay, so here's the plan. You ready? 
Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And everyone's like, yes, you're right. You just died and resurrected. We saw it. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. By the way, the only way you'll know what he commanded is by hanging out and listening to his voice above all else. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And here's the promise yet again. It's a through line. You could go through this entire um, timeline, this entire narrative in a lot of different ways. This one is understanding his presence. And that's why he ends Matthew chapter 28 with yet again another promise. And he says this, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Friends, I must tell you something. This is one promise that took me a while to understand. Here's why. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all give an eyewitness account to the life of Jesus. The very next chapter in the story is a book called, it's okay, it's Acts. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four guys, eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. And the very next chapter after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a book called, Wow. So Acts was written by a guy named Luke. Luke also wrote the book of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts. There's two volumes of one big story, but basically it's the chapter that happens next. Now here's where it gets crazy. Are you ready? Thinking caps on. Matthew chapter 28, he gives this promise. I'm with you always. The very last chapter in one of these books, he says, I'm with you always. The very next chapter, Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven. Is that confusing? Think about it. Watch this. I'm with you always and goodbye. <laughs> Ever thought about it? It's confusing. In fact, John chapter 16, he says this, verse 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. What in the world? How? Oh, John 16, 7 also says this, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. See, friends, Jesus always keeps his promises when he looked to his disciples and said, I'm gonna be in it with you all. Here's the deal. Jesus, fully God, fully man, could only walk with a few, but his promise was the end of the earth. And in order for him to keep his promise, in Acts chapter one, he ascends into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, which is where he's at today, Jesus is alive. But in Acts chapter two, he descends by the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell within those who believe. Jesus always keeps his promise. And this time, his promise of presence, church, is you. It's you. What you, I can't even, what you do really does matter. If you've ever looked in the mirror or just journaled that you think that you don't, read it. Because you are what Jesus is up to. You are the hands through which he gives people hugs. It's him partnered by his Holy Spirit in you. There's a new temple. And this time it's you. Because he promised to be with you, to make, command, to make disciples. That sounds impossible. He goes, it is without me, but I'm in it too. I'm in it. What you do this Christmas season to celebrate God's presence is to remember that you have it. You have it within you the moment you believe. And the best part is, you get to be a part of this epic story. You're invited. In fact, my favorite verse in the entire Bible is Acts chapter 1, verse 1. It's not a traditional favorite verse. I'll read it to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says this. In my former book, the book of Luke, we'll try again, Luke writes, <laughs> in my former book, the book of Luke's the answer, okay, so it's fine. In my former book, the book of, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Thus assuming the book of Acts is what Jesus is continuing to do, right? If the former book was what he began to do, the book of Acts is what he's continuing to do. And friends, 
In chapter 1, he ascends. In chapter 2, he descends to dwell within those two who believe, to look at you and say, do you want to know what I'm up to? The book of Acts, the church age, our age, what we do is what Jesus is up to. Do you want to know what God's up to in your workplace? Good. What are you up to in your workplace? Do you want to know what God's up to in your broken family? I know it's broken. Holidays, for some it's great. Some others are like, okay. Guess what God's up to in your broken family? Friends, what are you up to in your broken family? Because that might just precisely be what Jesus is up to. What you do matters. You're in this one epic story, but friends, this one epic story, this one timeline of what God is up to, of God wanting to draw near, this one epic story, friends, I gotta be honest with you, it's not about you. If you're looking for a story to jump into, one that's telling a narrative all about you, this is not the right one. But this is a story all about God, a God who wants to draw near to his people, and guess what his plan A is? To continue making his presence known, his plan is you. It started back in a garden. He met with his people on a mountaintop. Then he promised his presence through a tabernacle. He went through a temple and he shows up in a manger. And then he continues to use really imperfect people. Imperfect people that otherwise weren't even chosen. Twelve guys, which then turned into eleven guys. Then took this message to the ends of the earth. He even used a really unlikely guy named Paul. Why? Because the unlikely guy put a very likely God on display. And the story kept on going in generations and generations of all these people saying yes to God's call, yes to God's call, yes to God's call. And then one day there was a really depressed girl named Jenny. And when she was 16 years old, it was the darkest season of her life, and she said yes to a summer camp. She showed up to a summer camp, heard about this timeline, and heard the invitation to be a part of it. She said yes. She went to her youth pastor and goes, so what are you supposed to do now? She, he goes, serve the church, because that's you. You are the church. She goes, great, I'll do children's ministry. So she kind of jumps in, and they had this weekly thing called Awanas. Ever heard of it? And Jenny goes, okay, I'll serve there, but I don't feel like equipped to talk to people yet, so I'll just be in the back doing the snacks. <laughs> and they're like, great, that's a perfect place. So she sits in the back and gets her Dixie cups out and lines them with goldfish. This is her job at the church. She's like, I'm in for goldfish. And so she keeps on serving, right? And she keeps on serving, and every week, you know, she'll pray in the back, but really she just does her little part, really insignificant part. <laughs> but she does it in one particular week. They shared the timeline. They shared the story of God, and they invited a bunch of little nuggets to raise their hand and say yes to. And all of these hands went up that particular day, and they started matching with leaders, and they realized they didn't have enough leaders. <laughs> and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> so they looked at the people in the back, like, Jenny. She's like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good in the back. <laughs> have you ever felt ill-equipped? <laughs> She's like, I'm good in the back. They go, Jenny, we need you. And that day she said yes, and she went on to these blue staircases and sat with this little girl. Friends, I was that little girl. I was the little girl that a really ill-equipped girl said yes to Jesus. And then God, in partnership with Jenny, led me to the Lord, and here I am doing my little part of the timeline, standing before you and saying, are you in? And I don't, know, I don't know what yes looks like for you in this Christmas season, yes to the story, but you get to be a part of the timeline this Christmas season. This December actually matters. Who will you invite Christmas? Maybe that's the call for you to step into your part. Who will you invite? Who will you love? Or some of you, you've never stepped into the story. You're simply trying to live this story all about you, trying to make your life story significant. I'm here to tell you there's a much better story. <laughs> One that's all about God and his presence and he's inviting you to play a really active part in it. He didn't just save you from sin, he saves you for a purpose and he's inviting you to say yes. There are a few moments throughout my entire timeline where I said yes to Jesus, some profound moments. Sometimes it's a yes to salvation when I was young. Other times it's been a yes to saying, no, 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 this year I'm gonna make everything about Jesus. Not just my sin but also my gifts. Can I tell you one yes for my family? One yes, I remember being on the call with Nick Benoit when we talked about the potential of coming here consistently. That was a yes for us, but we had to pray about it. 
to fly across the country consistently with my little nuggets? <laughs> and we said yes, because we want to be a part of what he's up to. Friends, what is he asking of you? Because the truth is, I'm not where you're at. And I'm not, I'm not face-to-face with the people you're face-to-face with. God has a plan and he has a purpose for you this Christmas season. I just wonder, what's your yes? What is he asking of you this December? See, his promise of presence in the manger didn't stop in a manger. It's continuing through you. What's your yes? Yes.